In October 1943, 440 German prisoners of war arrived at a POW camp in Manitoba's Riding Mountain National Park. Although they lived in the park only for a brief two years, the POWs had a significant and lasting impact on the park's landscape. Located in central Manitoba, 300 kilometers northwest of Winnipeg, Riding Mountain National Park, outlined in green here, covers 3,000 square kilometers. Established in 1933, the park had a long history of supplying timber and firewood to the surrounding areas, so it came as no surprise when the Canadian government turned to the park's resources to prevent a predicted shortage of fuel wood in the winter of 1943. The first step was to find an appropriate location for a woodcutting camp. The Parks Bureau believed that the site would be found in an area that had recently been raised by a large fire in the 1930s, and by imposing a map showing the extent of the fire, I've highlighted the affected area in orange. After much deliberation, the Parks Bureau and the Fuelwood Controller decided to build a camp on the northwestern shore of Whitewater Lake. At this location, the Parks Bureau believed that the prisoners would be able to cut 200,000 cords of fuelwood. The view we see now is the main road leading to and from the camp and demonstrates the area in which the POWs worked and lived in. The camp was located 10 miles from the nearest public road to prevent any contact with civilians. Security at the camp was of the utmost concern. While a small group of guards provided the first level of defense, there were no guard towers or barbed wire fences. Instead, it was hoped that the miles of dense Canadian wilderness that surrounded the camp would be enough to contain any curious prisoners. Set boundaries were marked by red paint on trees or red flags, but these soon proved to be ineffective. The camp buildings, removed in 1945 and 1946, are seen here highlighted in red. The camp was built in the summer of 1943 at a cost of approximately $300,000. Fourteen buildings were constructed, including bunkhouses, a kitchen and mess hall, small hospital, barn, garage, guardhouse, administration building, and its powerhouse to provide electricity to the camp. 440 prisoners arrived on October 26, 1943. The majority of the men had been captured in the North African campaign, and after a brief stint in an Albertan internment camp, had volunteered to work in the outdoors. 400 of the men were assigned woodcutting duties, while the remaining 40 assisted with the day-to-day -day operation of the camp. While not working, the prisoners had access to a wide range of recreational opportunities. As seen in this photograph, the prisoners formed their own band, they made their own dugout canoes, which they paddled around Whitewater Lake, and more famously, they adopted a new mascot, Moshe, the camp bear, that a number of prisoners had come across on a hike on the northern shore of the lake. As for work, the prisoners worked eight-hour days, six days a week, and were expected to cut, stack, and haul three-quarters of a cord per man per day. Specifically instructed to leave spruce standing in hopes of regeneration, the prisoners focused their attention on the numerous poplar stands that dotted the area. The following videos simulate flyers over the site of the POW Labour Project. These images were taken in 1931, and the future site of the camp is highlighted in red. As you can see from the photos, the area was primarily poplar, with some scattered spruce stands. This next video shows a comparison between the 1931 flyover and one using photographs from 1949 and 1956. As you can see from the videos, the POWs deforested the area significantly, but left large stands of spruce in hopes that the population would regenerate. Comparing the previous imagery with color photographs from 1978, one can see that the site has changed significantly since the camp closed in 1945, demonstrating a significant regeneration of the spruce population. This next clip demonstrates the change over the last 30 years, comparing the 1978 aerial photographs with modern satellite imagery. The 
final comparison shows the differences between historical photographs and the modern satellite imagery. By highlighting the tree stands that appear in the 1949 series of photographs, one can clearly see how the landscape has changed since the POWs left the camp in 1945. I hope this has demonstrated that although the buildings and prisoners are long since gone from the northern shore of Whitewater Lake, this labor project has left a lasting impression on the landscape of Riding Mountain National Park.